uh, how you been, man? I'm doing all right. Um, I'm just ready. I'm ready to jump right in if you are. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, awesome. normally, normally I have a, a script of questions to, uh, to ask or, or kind of a rundown, but I feel like I know you well enough that we can just kind of wing it. Um, and <laughs> it's also been, I think it's been since March, right? Since we've actually, I mean, we've messaged each other over like social media and stuff, but I don't think I've actually seen you since, uh, COVID hit. Nah, I don't, I don't think so either. I've only really seen, uh, I went and saw Chase, uh, last month, but I had to fly up to Massachusetts and then drive to New Hampshire to see him. So he's really, I think the only person from Gordon I've seen since March. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll start with that because you were, uh, you were abroad this past semester, right? I was, yeah. Where'd you go? Uh, went to Croatia, uh, mainly, which is, Eastern Europe, uh, right, actually about like an hour plane ride away from Italy. So stayed in Zagreb for, um, I'd say probably about a third of the time. Uh, we actually went, spent most of the time on an island of Vis, which they actually filmed uh, Mamma Mia there. So in case you're wondering how gorgeous it is, yeah, it, <laughs> it's pretty gorgeous. So spent probably about two thirds of my study abroad there and it was really amazing. So I know Gordon has a lot of uh, study abroad programs that are really good. Um, I assume this was for one of those? Absolutely, yeah. This is kind of like the Balkan semester is kind of like the main one that uh, international affairs and political science like majors like myself are supposed to do. Tell me about your experience over there because I know COVID's kind of disrupted everything. I imagine it couldn't have been a completely normal uh, study abroad experience. So what were the kind of challenges that the pandemic uh, gave you guys? Oh, man, it was, it was definitely tough, because, you know, with the study abroad, the main thing that I think everyone, especially in this program, kind of capitalizes and emphasizes is that, you know, go out, talk to people, go to cafes, like, eat, and just like, experience the culture. And we couldn't do that honestly they like specifically said hey please don't eat indoors outside of like your apartment where you're staying and you know social distance and all that so we so COVID actually directly affected it because we spent of the first month of the study abroad in Vis, which still to this day has only two confirmed cases of COVID ever since the start so they have been locked down spent the first month there came back to Zagreb the capital of Croatia for about two, three weeks, but then uh, the second wave hit Europe and cases just started to skyrocket. Uh, Unfortunately, because a lot of people kind of just vacationed over the summer. So no one's smart anywhere around the world (laughs) with COVID. So we had to evacuate sort of kind of back to Vis and spent the last month there. So yeah, it was definitely kind of strange because I felt like you know, we were supposed to enjoy all of Croatia and we literally just experienced like two towns during there. And still, even then, it was absolutely amazing. Yeah, so I want to ask how you got into, uh, you said you did this for your international affairs major, is that right? It, it is, yeah. Yeah, so why'd you choose that major? I honestly don't even have an answer for you. Um, you know, I, I didn't really have a direction uh, for what I wanted to do and high school I think you know I had a general idea of I want to help people I want a job where I can go in and directly make people's lives for the better so I thought oh I could do that like through physical therapy so originally I thought I was going to go into Gordon with a kinesiology degree but then I took one semester my uh, senior year of high school of anatomy and physiology got a C in it and realized I hate anatomy (laughs) And, you know, it's kind of necessary for becoming a physical therapist. So I just started exploring new majors and the international affairs one stuck out to me at Gordon about, you know, learning uh, how to handle international crises and, you know, helping refugees, bringing food and all these major things that affect everyone in the world from a Christian perspective. And I'm like, okay, yeah, this sounds kind of cool. You know, maybe if I don't love it, I can change my major after the first semester and I didn't. I just kind of instantly fell in love with it. So it's weird. I kind of almost stumbled into it rather than like making a conscious choice about it. So you're a senior now. Um, 
and yeah. wrapping up your college career uh, in just a few more months. What do you want to do with that? Uh, well, thankfully, right now, I uh, to, had an internship last summer with a criminal justice reform nonprofit called Prison Fellowship, which is out of D.C. Uh, I'm hoping and I can apply to them in a month or two and they'll accept me because uh, I thought the internship went really great and they seem to enjoy having me there as well. Uh, so I'm hoping I can start off kind of working in criminal justice reform and you know, trying to make a difference that way. So kind of keeping with the academic stuff and then we can talk about some more uh, current events and everything and right. radio and things like that. Um, but just like I ask pretty much all my guests, um, tell me how you got to Gordon. What's your, what's your coming to Gordon story? Oh, man. Uh, well, I'll just be honest. When I was uh, in high school, I, I said I was a Christian. I wasn't acting like a Christian. I kind of was very much straying from my walk with God. And so in my mind, I was thinking like, I'm not going to a Christian college. Like I just need to like branch out and go elsewhere. And I looked at other schools. I, uh, I was uh, trying, I was trying to go for college basketball. I was being recruited by a few places, but uh, I just simply wasn't good enough to get any offers. And so kind of when that happened, I'm like, okay. So I looked at uh, Trenton state. I looked at uh, Amethyst or Amherst. I forget. It's a place in Massachusetts. So I'm like, okay, maybe let's try looking for some other colleges. And then a flyer just appeared one day when I got home from work for Gordon. Sure, I'll try it out. Went to campus. I'm like, hey, I actually kind of like that. This, this actually seems pretty cool. It seems like a good place. And then waited about a month or so and talked with my parents. Like, oh, what are your top three schools? I'm like, okay, I'll list Gordon as like my third. Because again, I'm like, I, I don't want to go to a Christian school. That, that's not me. So uh, when again... I ironically had the same tour guide as I did uh, six weeks prior. And he remembered my name as I was walking up to have an intake. He remembered my name and I'm like, okay, yeah, this, <laughs> this is the place. The fact that people actually care that much to remember a random guy's name after two months. I'm like, yeah, this is the place for me. So how's the experience been the last four years? Honestly, pretty amazing. Even kind of just, going in and trying to answer some of these big questions. Cause I feel like, you know, I don't want to knock secular schools too much because great. A lot of secular schools have great education. Um, kind of going in and answering big questions of why do bad things happen when God is so good? And why do, uh, why is this a problem? How can we tackle it from a Christian perspective without trying with like trying to create a more sustainable future? And I absolutely just love that stuff because I think those are similar questions I had um, myself and kind of just went in and Gordon really helped me answer it with the classes and stuff. So just the fact that I was able to, you know, kind of explore my own face and kind of figure out the burning questions of life. Uh, I absolutely loved it. So the first time I remember meeting you was towards the end of freshman year. Um, yeah through scout radio oh so, i remember that one yeah i think i think you went to go see infinity war right and uh <laughs> just needed a co-host for the sports show so yeah yeah no yeah, i think I felt um, it, yeah. yeah um yeah so tell tell me how uh tell me how that got started with uh with it was broadcast something that you had your eye on as a side thing that you wanted to do or how did that happen uh not really. I mean, I remember uh, my, I have an older brother. He went to Champlain College up in Vermont and he had a radio show himself. So it was just a really cool thing. Just like, you know, listen to that and listen to my family and kind of hear his thoughts. And it was kind of like, yeah, I can connect to him still because, you know, we have trouble communicating sometimes. So the fact that I was able to hear him like, oh, that's really cool. And then Scott Radio came up. And I was like, man, what do, like, what can I even talk about? And then, you know, it was my roommate at the time, Corey, he said to me, literally all you talk about is like the Celtics and Patriots. Just go talk about that. I'm sick of hearing it. <laughs> and so I'm like, cool, I'm going to make a show all about, I'm the extremely biased and just talk about Boston sports. And then, yeah, I think just kind of like, it was also cool because uh, the tech intern at the time was uh woman a woman named savannah who i think she's actually 
one of the executives got ready right now. Savannah and Cortez. Then, yeah. Oh, she's an amazing yeah. dude. She's fantastic. But she um she was a Spurs fan. So I'm like, okay, this is destiny. Clearly, <laughs> clearly. And it honestly it was kind of just I continued with it and I did uh the a show in the last two years with Chase. Literally, because it's like, you know, we literally just like talk about this stuff normally. Why not just go on air and talk about it for fun? Yeah, so you did uh, buy a sports talk, I think was the name the first year. Yep. And then uh, then you transitioned to the end um, with Chase. So yeah. d- tell me what that was all about. Uh, uh, it originally kind of just started out sports, but we would kind of dip our toes into like political stuff sometimes when we went with that. And then Chase and I noticed that we kind of both had a passion for politics and talking about it, except I consider myself like left-leaning in my views and he's right-leaning and yet we were still roommates and we're still friends and able to get along and we're like hey we should actually like try to set an example for other people and just talk about these issues and just be like hey you know what our our differences really aren't as big as we really think they are so we just started dedicating uh half a show for sports which was uh, honestly fun we would just do hockey and basketball and all that and that was the mild portion of the show and then as soon as we got into politics things just heated up and then at the very end chase and i after yelling at each other for half an hour just went and got taco bell and <laughs> it showed that it was, it was pretty nice honestly awesome. yeah yeah well on that note i guess uh i don't know we've like i said it's been a while since we caught up with each other so i, I don't know if you want to talk uh sports or i know you're in georgia now so i get the political world's been crazy oh my god everywhere but in georgia in particular i I can't imagine what the tv ads have looked like and i've got to got to imagine there's there's signs everywhere and everything still from the senate races but i guess i guess we can talk we can talk a little bit of sports first um oh obviously gotta ease into it (laughs) yeah um so you're obviously a boston sports fan Um, i am have you been in Massachusetts your whole life or did you move there? How did, how did the Boston sports connection start with you? Um, my parents actually uh, lived in Boston for about 15 years. I was uh, born at, me and my brother were both born in Boston in Mass General. And then when we were three, moved to Delaware for a little while. That's right. I remember you. Yeah. yeah I remember that now. <laughs> oh yeah. I was remember, oh, it was Blue Diamond, right? The, uh, Something like uh, that. Yeah. Oh, I love, I love that blue and all time. I, off topic. Yeah. So then moved to Connecticut. So I've kind of always been Northeast area where it's not weird to be a Boston sports fan. And yeah, I just always went up, you know, it was a three hour drive to Boston. Always went to Fenway Park every single year. My dad always made sure of that. And somehow he always, always won these insanely good tickets. Like one time we were able to, get up on the green monster uh he won tickets to go to game one of the 2013 world series versus the cardinals so it's just kind of really been awesome i've been able to kind of just stay connected to boston and i guess that was kind of partially why i chose gordon just because of its proximity to the area i just love the city and you're a fan of all four boston sports teams across the board uh yes it is (laughs) Cause, uh, yeah. I know I know Chase deflects in football. He's a he's a Jets fan. <laughs> but uh, we we've been trying to convert him for years. I think the closest we got was um, this year when Adam Gase was the coach. <laughs> but I'll, I'll give him credit. He's an extremely loyal fan, even though Jets were like arguably like one of the worst teams of all time this year. Uh, yeah, yeah, like Patriots or Jets the last twenty years. <laughs> like, who would you rather? that's what i'm that's what i'm guessing because obviously i mean i my um my dad was you know usually always a boston sports and he went through the years with the patriots where they just were downright bad he went through most of the curse of the bambino with the Sox, and he started becoming a celtics fan post bird era so he didn't see a championship till 2008 so i say I've really been kind of blessed and this is definitely the golden age for Boston sports. We're kind of slowly seeing that come to an end. And I'm like, you know what? I understand it's, it's gotta happen sometimes. 
Yeah, well, I guess talk a little bit about the Patriots first. Um, was it the first time, I guess, first time since 08 that they missed the playoffs? But uh, yeah, they, they, in 08, they were 11 and five and didn't even have Brady. So they still had a pretty good season. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, with Brady leaving when and, you know, Grant coming out of retirement to go to another team and basically everyone just leaving. I, I predicted the Patriots actually going to go uh, five and 11 this year. So they exceeded my expectations. But as soon as uh, the Patriots brought in Cam Newton, I'm like, okay, we're going to suck this year. <laughs> Cam can't throw a ball more than 15 yards. Like, this is a problem. Yeah, well, I was kind of surprised that the Patriots struggled a little bit because, you know, everybody talks about Tom Brady being a system quarterback and, and everything. And, you know, the guys in his early 40s still doing a phenomenal job. But I was surprised at how well he's adapted to a – to the system in Tampa and the fact that they're still in the playoffs uh, looking to make a run now. Yeah. I mean, I was really surprised too. Uh, I mean, cause even hearing stuff from last season about Bruce um, Arians and, you know, Jameis Winston threw for 30 some odd interceptions, which is like the most ever in a season and hearing like, Oh yeah, Bruce Arians, he's got, guys running out 20 yards then an option either way and it's a really complex offense and system I'm like yeah, I don't think even though you know Brady has this amazing receiving core I'm not sure how great he's gonna do and once again Tom Brady has proven he is uh, he's just otherworldly at this point there's no other way to describe it yeah I remember those uh because I think Winston threw 30 touchdowns as well so everybody was making a joke like they should do a 30 for 30 on Winston's 30 for 30 <laughs> oh, <laughs> but, that, uh, that would have been cool honestly I'd definitely watch that <laughs> yeah yes yeah, so do you have a do you have a Super Bowl prediction at all this year uh, this year I gotta go it's gonna sound super basic but I don't see it going any other way of Chiefs Packers I mean Aaron Rodgers is having MVP caliber season. Patrick Mahomes is, he's still Patrick Mahomes, the greatest quarterback I've ever seen so far. And then, you know, both teams got good defenses. Both teams kind of have easy matchups going into this. So uh, I don't really, I, I see it no going no other way, despite the two best teams going at it. Yeah. I think I'm just kind of rooting for the chaos of a Browns Super Bowl. <laughs> um, I think I would just be unbelievably awesome and hilarious but i i would love to see that especially just because you know they're they're the browns (laughs) they're bad but even just you know after they uh, just destroyed the steelers uh all the players coming out and just being so salty about it like chase claypool just being uh oh yeah you know they're gonna get absolutely destroyed by the chiefs and it's like and you got destroyed by them. So <laughs> stop yeah. being mad, dude. Yeah, well, I guess I should ask, um, is there any loyalty to uh, to Brady and Gronk? Are you rooting for Tampa Bay at all? Because I know like when, when LeBron left Cleveland the first time, everybody hated Miami uh, in Ohio. But I've got to think that the story in, in New England's got to be a little bit different because of the, the manner in which Brady left towards the end of his career after all the success that you guys had. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, six Super Bowl titles, like nine, like 20 division titles or however long it's been. It's like, yeah, I I hate he left. I would have loved him to stay. But if anyone in the entire sports world has earned to go to another team, it's got to be Tom Brady. So still rooting for him a bit. Um, Not sure how well he's going to do, but if he does make it to the Super Bowl, uh, I will absolutely uh, break out my Brady jersey and wear it. Sounds good. Yeah, well, I, I got to ask you, um, everything everything here in Philly has been kind of – I say here in Philly, I'm in Delaware, so I'm just south of Philadelphia. Oh, but close enough. Basically in the market. <laughs> um, all of us here have been uh, going crazy the last week with uh, Doug Peterson getting let go. <laughs> so yeah, what are you – what are your thoughts on that? Because I mean, you you brought it up on yeah. Instagram, well, I want to get you, I want to get your thoughts too, just from somebody who's who doesn't have a bias of being 
a local here. Um, but you know, I was I was kind of on the fence about it until until the last game against Washington. Um, oh my! Wow. That, <laughs> like it was it wasn't even that he did it. It was that he went into the post game press conference and said, "Oh yeah, I was coaching to win. <laughs> Absolutely." <laughs> I'm like, okay, Jalen Hurts. You know, struggled a bit in that game, but he was playing well. Don't get me wrong, he was playing well. And even you know, if you don't want to play Jalen Hurts, you want a more experienced person great you have a guy who was supposed to be the mvp before he tore his acl and carson wentz sitting on the bench and you go for a third string guy whose name i can't even recall right Sudfeld. yeah Sudfeld. Yeah. so well, um, he's, been, he's been the third stringer for four years now he uh he played in the the nfc championship game they beat against the vikings he took the last snap when they were taking a knee to win the game so he's, he's been it so like it I don't understand the argument. It's like, oh, well, we wanted to get Nate some reps. Like, he's been your third stringer for four years now. You're not, he's, he's not the future of the franchise. You're not trying to develop him. He's your emergency quarterback. Yeah. And, and, and you say, and you say, try to pull that off and then say, oh, yeah, we were coaching to win the game. It just makes no sense. It, it doesn't. And even, you know, kind of like some of the stuff leading up to that with Doug Peterson, you know, uh, firing the offensive coordinator last season it's like okay i, I can kind of understand that offense wasn't too too great last year like who are you gonna hire oh no one i'll run the offense myself and then you guys end up like 27th or 28th on offense and then at the end when he gets fired he had comments somewhere along the lines of like oh you know i just felt like the front office was stepping on my toes a lot and i don't like being told what to do it's like you're like a 50 year old man and that's your reason come on yeah it's uh it's it's dysfunctional um to say the least but yeah well now, and now you've got the because because they were saying one's probably is gonna ask for a, tr- a trade um because the relationship with him and peterson was fractured beyond repair but now peterson's gone so you've got the quarterback controversy again with hurts so now <sighs> what do you do it's it's once versus Foles, now once versus Hurts. It's controversy all over again. Yeah, it it really sucks because I 100% believe uh, Wentz could be one of the better quarterbacks in this league. I think, you know, despite his injuries and stuff, I think he's proven he can be a top 15, top 12 quarterback in the league unquestionably. And then I think, you know, the Eagles didn't really make the best choice. Because, you know, last season, top receiver was Alshon Jeffrey, who he's a good wide receiver, just not, not a great number one option. So so instead of going out and picking up, uh, you know, Justin Jeffries or uh, that or C.D. Lamb or, you know, other people that you could have picked to surround once a town, you pick up another quarterback. It's like, wh- how, what does that speak to your starter in the trust you're trying to, to create? for him you're you're saying okay you got to play well but we're going to give you no help and it's you can't do that to someone honestly yeah yeah i think it's it's hard to deny that once had a pretty bad season um but at the same time you have to look at i think the injuries that piled up and oh yeah you know, the, the fact that the fact that he didn't have a lot of help from his coaching staff or uh receivers and players so yeah it's, it's a combination I... of both things yeah, even I saw, you know, I think it was your Philly's offensive line was ranked last in the league and have given up something like five, six sacks a game. So it's like, great, you're getting hit like once every single drive hard. Uh, you, that's tough that you got to watch out for that. You can't trust your O-line. Yeah, I think Peter's got, I mean, Peter's is getting up there in age anyway, but I think he's, yeah. I think he got hurt again and some, I, I I tried to tune it out at, at some point. I just like, I, I stopped caring. I lost all hope for the season or anything. Um, uh, I, I understand that. It's still, it's still crazy to me to think that going into week 16, if the Eagles won, I think it was their last two games and everyone else in the conference lost their, uh, excuse me, division lost their last two games. Eagles still could have made the playoffs at like six, nine, and one 
or whatever it was. The Giants could have been six and ten. If the right. Eagles had won that game, they would have been six and ten. And yeah. That's 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 insane to me, honestly. And even, you know, the uh, Washington football team went in at seven and nine. And even like I don't know, like obviously I think it was, I think it was the third time ever a team with a seven win team made the playoffs. Yeah, and even and even the crazy of Chase Young going in with unshakable confidence, like I want Tom Brady. It's like, dude, you haven't gotten a winning record yet. Relax. Yeah, well, I guess we can uh, move on to some basketball stuff now. Um, this, yeah, the NBA got shaken up a little bit the last 24, 48 <laughs> hours. Um, yeah, I think the Sixers were kind of a. Uh, my Sixers were kind of in the running for James Harden, but uh, ended up going to the Nets. And I'm, I'm, I've got to say, I'm actually kind of glad that uh, I think we kind of dodged a bullet there. But what do you think of the Harden trade? Um, I, I just wow. I would because um, even what the Nets gave up is essentially you know three first round picks, four swaps. So essentially, their next seven years of first round draft picks. Their starting center, Jared Allen, who I absolutely love. I love the guy's game. Um, Torian Prince, solid 3 and D guy. And Karis LeVert, who's putting up almost 20 off the bench for arguably one of the most controversial and tough to play with players in the entire league. I mean, I think Shaq said it best. It was last night, the night before on TNT when it happened. He said, they win the championship now or the trades a bust. And I got to agree with him, honestly. Yeah, it reminds me of a few years ago when they made the trade with the Celtics and they got uh, Garnett and Pierce and all those guys. And it was kind of the same thing. It was like, okay, either you go all in this year and you win it or, and it actually ended, ended up happening to them. You, you're you going to really stink for a few years afterwards. It's yeah. going to take some time to rebuild. So I feel like they've kind of gone with the same strategy now. And maybe it's a little bit better because – you know, Garnett and Pierce were kind of out of their primes at that point in their careers. Um, but you've got you've got something that to me looks so good on paper. But I think I think it was just announced within the last couple hours or so that uh, they, they gave Kyrie Irving a massive fine because of his yeah. antics and Harden has antics of his own. KD's had some injury questions. So, you know, how, how reliable is this lineup really? That's that's my biggest question because I think even um, Kyrie, you mentioned, you know, just got it was a fifty thousand dollar fine and had to forfeit eight hundred thousand dollars for a game salary because he's missed the last four or five games for personal reasons. And when asked about it, he said, "Oh, I just I just didn't feel like playing." It's like, come on, at least like I'll give Katie credit. Obviously, I still think he's a snake going to Golden State four years ago. He's coming out and he's trying his best every single night. And he's not saying much to the media, being quiet and just playing great. And then, you know, your co-star who's supposed to be your star, the second star on the team is acting like this. And you're just like, I'm so glad Kyrie left Boston, honestly. <laughs> yeah. that, that's literally all I just got to say about it. <laughs> Yeah, we, we had Stephen French on a couple of months ago, and he's he was saying that once COVID passes over and the and the stadiums open up again, like he wants to the first time, whatever team Kyrie's on, when they come to Boston, he's going to go to that game just to boo Kyrie. <laughs> we haven't gotten the chance yet. I mean, yeah. I think the first time he was supposed to go back to Boston, he got a mysterious knee injury. So it's like, okay, he's – He's scared of coming back to TD with the fans. I don't blame him. Boston can be ruthless sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. But the Sixers, they were saying, uh, we're maybe willing to give up Ben Simmons to get him. And I think, I think that would have been a mistake. Absolutely. Yeah. I heard, uh, I'm sure you heard it as well. The asking price for Harden was going to be Ben Simmons, Tyrese Maxey, and then uh, draft compensation. Oh. I'm like, look, you know, people rag on Ben Simmons all the time for his inability to shoot the ball. And, Oh, he doesn't have a jump shot. Can't make a, a three. I'm like, yeah, but guess what? He's like one of the best defenders, like one of the best perimeter yeah. defenders in the league. And that's why, that's why I keep telling people is like, he, he can do 
everything at an elite level except shoot. Yeah. So you've got, I mean, you've got Seth Curry now shooting uh, one of the best shooters in the percentage wise right now. Nearly 60%. Yeah. Yeah. I, no, I think, I, I think Steph's the better over, all around <laughs> overall player, but you, you look at how accurate Seth is when he gets open, you know. I, I got, I got to say, I loved uh, what the Sixers did this off season. Um, bringing in a lot of shooters because that was your guys' biggest problem last year was no one could shoot the ball outside of like Tobias Harris. So bringing in um, Seth Curry, uh, giving Shake Milton more minutes. He had a great 31 point performance last night. So honestly, Ben doesn't need to shoot the ball. He's putting up eight rebounds a night, eight assists a night with two steals and 15. I don't need someone to shoot a three then you're, you're fine. Yeah. Well, and also uh, your guy's former coach, uh, Doc Rivers coming in, Doc. I think was also a major, major upgrade. I think so. Cause I think I, cause even, you know, any, anything is a better over Brett Brown is are arguably the most talented team last year was the 76ers and you guys, couldn't even win a playoff game at that point it's just all coach they, they lost they lost two home games all year <sighs> they only lost two home games but on the road they were it was it was a completely different team and then you get into the bubble and you know it, it's not the same environment as a, as a home game obviously so yeah it's uh, it was i honestly like i know you know i'm a Celtics fan i'm supposed to hate philly i actually really like philly's team i think joel and bead's phenomenal ben simmons I'm supposed to make fun of him, but he's great. Uh, and even I just think, you know, getting rid of Al Horford, that solved probably about half of your spacing issues. Yeah. Well, it, kill, yeah, it kills me as a, a family in Florida, so I'm a big Gator fan. So we've, uh, we've loved Al Horford in this family for years, um, but it just did not work out at all with the uh, Sixers. Yeah, no, that was, that was tough. And honestly, I don't – I think it was partially also – Brett Brown's fault because I don't think he was really put in the best position because it's like hey you know we got Joel he's obviously the franchise centerpiece at center um and we want you to you know focus more on playing around the perimeter and it's like okay but that's not his game he's not like naturally a power forward so it it really just kind of put him in a tough situation yeah well I I actually I've got to ask you because I don't know off the top of my head what the Celtics record is right now um, I know they've they've been dealing with some COVID issues, right? Mm. Yeah, I think I Tatum I know had to go under um, uh, the safety protocol. It had a quarantine ten to fourteen days, and literally, you know, Jalen uh, had to as well. Tristan Thompson, Robert Williams. I think it was literally like over half our roster had to do that, and I think we finally just got nine guys that are actually active who can actually play tonight uh, versus the magic. But yeah, we had like three, four games postponed and somehow we get any game we want postponed and the Sixers yeah. have to suit up an injury. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I know I'm biased oh. obviously, and I'm not going to oh. put my, I'm not going to put my tinfoil hat on and come up with a bunch of conspiracy theories, but it, it is kind of frustrating to me. Like why did, why did the Celtics get to have a few postponements? Whereas the Sixers literally had to dress an injured player <laughs> so that they could have eight guys on the, on the roster. Yeah, no, I honestly, I don't even think that's conspiracy theorists. Cause even, you know, I saw uh, a lot of people on Celtics Twitter being like, okay, yeah, this is a little ridiculous too. When you have to have Danny green as your starting power forward, uh, clearly you just, you cannot yeah. compete at a high level. Why Howard was playing point guard. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and like, just, just think about that for a second. Like, uh, it, it's yeah, I got it. credit where credit is due. A lot of the guys on the Sixers stepped up. I know, like, you know, Danny Green hit nine threes. Max Tyrese, exploded for oh, almost 40. Yeah, yeah, he had 39. He was great, but you guys dropped, I think, one, two games, one to the Nuggets and one in Mount that because you can't compete against great teams when you have half a roster. Like, that's just unfair. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm I'm hopeful though. Hopefully, uh, you know, as long as you don't have any more COVID issues or anything, people stay safe. That 
this this looks like a good team. Finally, you know, I've I've always had reservations about like ever ever since the the process kind of ended. And it's like okay, well now we're we're going in. We're we're actually trying to compete. We're trying to win. There's always been something about the team that doesn't look right to me. But this this team looks like they're they could be a serious contender. Uh, if they wrinkle out a few issues. They do, yeah. Honestly, I mean, even Joe Wells kind of leading MVP stuff right now. And, uh, yeah, literally the only problem you guys' team had was shooting. And then you went out and got shooters, and, hey, look at that. I, I'd say you're a top three, maybe top two team in the East right now. Yeah. Yeah, so obviously it's it's still way too early, and uh, everything's really chaotic right now um, in, in the league. But do you have a finals prediction? For this year? Uh, I do, yes. I am going to go bold and say the Boston Celtics are going to make the finals in the East because I think they've proven they can, if they play well, that's a big if, they can beat any team in the league, even without Kemba Walker uh, starting. And then out West, I think it's boring, but it's going to be the Lakers again. I mean... I've doubted LeBron enough times in my life to be like, okay, I have to stop. He's, he's going for ring number, uh, was it five right uh, now? Yeah. Five, yeah. So I think it would be Lakers-Celtics and totally unbiased opinion, uh, Celtics and seven in that one. Okay, wow, all right. <laughs> Maybe a little biased. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've, got, I've got to say I'm with you in the West, um, the Lakers and – Again, maybe maybe this is my bias showing through as well, but uh, I think if Kyrie sorts out his issues, if the Nets actually can somehow work together, develop, give them a couple months to develop the chemistry, I think they, they'll be unstoppable. But my yeah. confidence in that is pretty low at the moment. So I would say right now, I think the team in the best spot might actually be Philadelphia. Yeah. And I'd, But the, I don't know if you can overcome – the Lakers in the finals. That's, that's still a big question to me. So, yeah, it's how do you, it's the biggest question for literally every team out East is great. You win the East. What's your game plan to stop LeBron? Yeah. Cause well, and that was, everybody said like the last time it was Lakers Celtics was a one and everybody said, well, look, you, you've got Iverson. All right. So he'll, he'll get you one, but it's going to be Lakers in five. And that's exactly what, exactly what happened. So yeah. You know, what's what's your game plan to take down LeBron and AD? That's you know, what you got to figure out. It's it's tough to do, honestly, cuz even you know, I think AD has evolved his game so much that he's a threat from everywhere. And so it's literally like I feel like the game plan just has to be let LeBron and Davis each drop 50 and then just hold everyone else cuz they'll get theirs. As long as no one else gets above like eight, you should be okay. Yeah. Well, uh, so actually, I guess I should ask. Um, do you have any time commitments this afternoon? Because I, I can go as long as we want, really. Oh, um, no, not but, at all. I'm literally just yeah. going to the gym, but that's not until like four o'clock or yeah. so. Yeah. Um, I want I want to get your opinions on uh, baseball and major league baseball in particular. Um. You know, there there was a lot of controversy this summer with trying to get the season started and everything, and yeah, Rob Manfred expanding expanding the playoffs, and you got the universal DH coming in, and there are rumors about a pitch clock now, the extra innings rule. What do you make of all these <sighs> changes to really the fundamental aspects of the game? I'm not a fan of it. Um, I think the universal DH is idiotic. Because it's, I think at a certain point, you know, I think Manfield's trying to uh, promote baseball more and get more newer fans engaged with it. Because right now it has perception of being boring. Honestly, you can't change the game too much. You have to keep tradition. So pitching clocks, I get maybe implemented that. Universal DH, I think, is an idiotic rule. Yeah, well, I guess they wanted the main thing was to speed up the games a little bit. Um, the intentional walk rule, I didn't even think of that, but you know, you can you can go like watch videos on YouTube. Like it's it's hard for some pitchers to throw intentional walks. Like it, it's not natural to them. And you see, no, like every not. once in a while, 
a guy just says kind of, you know, what, what the heck I'll swing at it. <laughs> the base hitter gets a home run when they were trying to walk him. Hit a bomb. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's tough. I get they're trying to like speed up the game, but I think more than anything, the problem is baseball is definitely a mental game. I think the the biggest difference between it is uh, for any other sport really is there's no way to run out the clock. There's no way to, you know, sneak your way in and have a better strategy than the other team. It's, you got to play every single play and you got to be alert every single play. So I think baseball is just as much of a mental game as it is actually playing. And if you try to take more of that away, I I'm just not too sure how, you know, how good you can actually be. Yeah. Well, I think it's kind of, you know, in, with my world in a uh, motor racing and seeing what NASCAR has done the last 15, 20 years, I think it's kind of the same thing. You know, you've, you've fundamentally changed the racing and, and how the sport works and what have the ratings done? What's the attendance done? It's just been a complete nosedive into the ground. And I think you're kind of seeing the same thing with baseball with uh, the world series this past October with the ratings being as low as they were. Um, because I, I think the NFL, well, no, actually not the NFL, um, the NBA and the XFL, I think kind of have, the excuse of, you know, it, it, it's hard to get into football in the spring. It's hard to get into basketball in August and September, you know, when you're not really, I guess, I guess women's basketball is kind of year round, but, you know, f- fans who follow the league, follow the sport, you know, it just, it just doesn't feel right. And it's like, oh, football's on in April. And, you know, you don't really have the energy to get invested into it and just, start following along at the same level that you would the NFL. Um, but major league baseball, you know, they don't, they didn't have that excuse for their ratings being as, as low as they were. So, you know, yes, ratings were down across the board for sports with this whole COVID interruption, but you know, what, what's, what's the explanation for baseball? And I feel like a large part of it is the fact that you expanded the playoffs to the point where, the Astros who were one game below 500 almost made the world series. <laughs> yeah. And coming off of the, the cheating scandal and everything that, that, that wasn't very popular at all. Um, no, it's, and th- this is kind of like, I think a problem is, you know, there have been issues in the NFL and part of the reason why people get upset with them and don't watch them is it seems like, you know, with all the domestic abuse and, of violence that can be directly linked to the NFL, the league seems to be doing nothing about it. And so they come off as irresponsible. The same thing is happening with the MLB right now. You know, you had probably the biggest cheating scandal since the 1919 uh, Black Sox. And you, you say, hey, we're going we're gonna to take away one of your draft picks and fine you. It's like, that's it for – like making the world series two years in a row off of that there's got to be more well, two, two out of three years because it was uh, two out of three years yeah yeah, yeah and, and your red sox wanted in 18 but but yeah they, but they were questioning uh you guys with uh with cora and everything same time i don't think they found as much but yeah they yeah. they basically found that the Sox were uh i think it was they had a guy out in center field who was supposed to just be uh, filming the game and taking pictures and stuff. And he was actually catching the catcher signals and they would try to, they would send that back to the clubhouse to kind of find tweaks and stuff, try to figure out more patterns, but it is the illegal use of a video camera. So Sox got punished for that. They got caught cheating and yeah, you kind of deserve to get punished yeah. for that one. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't know if you've got anything else you want to, talk about uh on the sports side of things um Um, i know only thing i gotta say for the mlb is you know padre has just added i think you darvish uh right i remember yeah so uh i want to say you know padres might be the favorite going into it because they also got like uh manny machado and uh, a few other people that look pretty nice but they're the padres they're (laughs) they're kind of like the knicks of the baseball world it's, yeah. no matter how many good players they have they'll always find a way to screw it up yeah yeah and i guess it's a uh, nhl just restarted so it's a little early to make any predictions on that side of, <laughs> of things yeah. but, 
it's always hard to make predictions with a with a parody in the NHL, but <laughs> yeah, that's that's just like you know one thing uh, is I find it like you know I haven't super been into hockey, but you know when playoffs come around, I'll watch it and all that. And the and the thing that just like did it in for me was uh, when the Tampa Bay Lightning had I think the greatest offensive season of all time in 2018 and then they got swept in the first round by the capitals and i'm like i <laughs> i don't understand hockey anymore i don't yeah. i don't get what's going on <laughs> yeah yeah i don't i've got mixed feelings about the i mean i just i just did a whole video on nascar's playoffs um oh, i i love that video by the yeah. way that, that explained it very well yeah i appreciate that but uh just like across across all sports like i like how the premier league in europe how how they how they run their season like just tally up the points at the end of the year and you can't make any argument that the champion is undeserving or not the best team it's not as uh, you know it's it's not as exciting to watch um it's kind of anticlimactic but uh you know you you, you can't make any arguments against the system i think because it always crowns a deserving champion and you think back to how baseball was way back in the day you know now we're talking 16 teams and, and half the league you know it used to just be okay you win the al great you win the nl great guess what you're going straight to the world series like i yeah. i honestly don't really have a problem with that <laughs> yeah no i think um there's always a bit i think too much even i think you know even like the NBA's playoffs, I think, it can be a little messed up a bit because, you know, you got, like, the uh, West is obviously better than the East. And in the East, you always get, like, the the Magic or the Hawks who will sneak in at the A seed and then just get swept in the first round. And there's always teams like that. So it's like, great, what's the, what's the point of even playing a seventh and eighth seed? Because they're just going to get beat. So I think, you know, I think that's part of, you know, the problem with NASCAR that's so inaccessible. And like you said in your video, you have to learn a very complex system just to follow. So I think honestly for sports teams and stuff, it's legitimately just got to be uh, the simpler, the better. Because even I've tried to understand college football power rankings and how teams get into the top four. Can't do it. Yeah, it's it's, it's just difficult. as controversial, I think. The, the cutoff between four and five is the cut off the end of the national championship game was so yeah. I don't think people have suggested like go to eight teams and like take the power five each of the power five champions and three teams at large or maybe you know let let a group of five team in at the eight seed and give them a shot like give the UCF a shot a few years ago yeah because right. even you know a lot of it goes off of strength of schedule yeah and it's like okay so the college football committee determines who plays what and so basically at the beginning of the year, like with Central Florida, is you're saying because of the schedule you gave them, it's impossible for them to get into the top four. And that, that's a little ridiculous, aren't they? Because it's great. Alabama's going to get in the top four no matter what. Like that's just a fact yeah. at this point. Yeah, well, and, and Cincinnati this year almost beating Georgia in their, in their bowl game. They were one first down away from doing that. I think it kind of makes a statement like, you know, don't make us the number one seed, but you know, give it, <laughs> give us a shot. You know yeah. what? Why not? Because I mean, they put they put Notre Dame in of uh, the four seed, even though they had a loss. They didn't even win the ACC, and they're like, hey, you know, go play Bama, and it was like, you know, the final score was like twenty eight thirteen or something. Not horrific, but if if you just watched the game, you could just tell Notre Dame was just outmatched. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's kind of the, like, if you look at college sports, like football, football, the playoffs are too small. And, you know, I love March Madness for the entertainment of it, but you can, you can make a case that 68 teams is, yeah, that's pretty overkill. Um, if you want, if you want to talk strictly about legitimacy, I know they're never going to change that because it's tradition and, no. you know, fans get excited about it. And uh, it's, it's almost universally accepted as, just the way things are done, but you know, it is kind of hard to deny that I think 68 is a little over the top, but yeah, because I think even like, you know, length of season and playoffs just kind of 
were into it because I think part of the problem with baseball is definitely no, they got 162 games. You have to stay invested and watch series like three games at a time, day of rest, then a four game series, two rest, then a five game series. And you have to pay attention to that for four or five months. And then it's, oh, it's the wild card playoff game. And oh, then it's the first round. Then it's this and this. And it's like, okay, well, yeah. you know what, with the NFL, it's you got 16 weeks. You got to pay attention one day a week for four months. And then you just got to watch the Super Bowl and that's it. And that works. Yeah. Well, there's no, there's no universal playoff system that you can apply to all sports because oh. in, in, yeah, like I, well, like I even said in my video, um, you know, the NFL, you only play 16 games a year. You can't play every team in the league. So you have to have playoffs so that the best teams can play each other so that you can make that claim that, okay, you know, we, we beat this team in the Super Bowl and we didn't get a chance to play them in the regular season because we only play four teams that aren't in our conference. Whereas you look at baseball, they play 162 games a year. You know, it's a little bit easier to say this team has a better record averaged out all over over 160 games, you know, do we really need 16 teams in the playoffs? And like, obviously I'm biased, but I, I think eight was plenty. I think even going to 10 a few years ago was, you know, I guess <laughs> they wanted, they wanted the excitement of the playing game every year, which I get, but you know, at, at what point do you stop sacrificing legitimacy and fairness for the sake of entertainment and trying to draw in viewers and make more money? You know, it's, it's a question that needs to be answered. Yeah, it's, it's a big question. Even, you know, you get to a point where even it's the fault uh, with racing and all that, which you mentioned in your video, is you don't even have to, like, place well in every single race. You just have to place, like, win this race or place top five in these two races, and you can just get in because games yeah. or races are worth more than others. That point's like, okay, well, at least in other sports, it's one game is worth – one win doesn't matter uh, sometimes division and conference and stuff plays into it but most of the time what it comes down to is just great you won more games than the other team congrats you're in yeah well and also in race you're you're running against 39 opponents in yeah. one event it's not just you and the other guy so it's yeah i mean there there's no there's no defending it <laughs> I, I made that clear <laughs> enough I'll, I'll link the video somewhere here um so you can go check that out, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm I'm wondering how this like my my channel's kind of so, a couple of videos like I think hit the algorithm, so I've actually oh, gained quite a few idea. subscribers and and stuff over the last couple of weeks. So that that's I'm wondering good. how the video is going to do when when we put this up because it's not what this new audience has been used to. Um, but we'll no. see. I mean, it. I mean, you said this again, but the, just the YouTube it does not support small creators it's yeah. and they just keep putting in more restrictions i don't know if you have to cut this out of your video or not or else the youtube <laughs> overlords are gonna hate it wow. but it's there's there's enough common criticism i think but you know it used to be it used to be um ten thousand views like total on your entire channel and you can get monetized which it if you put out enough content like it's not that hard to do at all um, no. you know, you really, you need one video to kind of get some traction. And like, if you keep putting out enough, like if you put out a hundred videos and they each get a hundred views, like you, you just do, do the math, you know, that's not very many views on each video, but you know, you're there and then you can start monetizing. Now it's 4,000 hours of watch time and a thousand subscribers, which, you know, you think about how long it takes when you don't have viewership and your videos aren't getting picked up by the algorithm like where's the motive because like at least when you were, could get monetized super early you had a little bit of motivation coming in to keep going like it just takes so long now to to build that up unless you get really lucky and one of your videos goes viral but yeah so i actually hit the watch hour requirement um a couple weeks ago for this channel so hopefully we're, we're, we're getting there with the subscribers not not that i'm in this for <laughs> the money exclusively or anything like that but it would be nice to have a little bit coming in on the side so yeah and even and even i saw stuff with like the new youtube restrictions of like you said uh four thousand hours of watch time or whatever 
people I saw people who hit those benchmarks and they still weren't getting monetized because YouTube just like, oh well you have we you they were literally just like oh yeah I've hit five thousand watch hours and I have fifteen thousand subscribers like oh we're still not going to monetize you for some reason it's like then why are you making these rules yeah it's I don't know if it's reused content is one that pops up a lot like I guess people who make compilation videos, which, it, you know, copyright rules, it's, it's understandable, but, you know, where do you draw the line of fair use? Like, it's, I don't envy the people that make the decisions because it's, it, it is a complicated issue, but at the same time, I feel like it, it's not as creator friendly as it used to be maybe five, 10 years ago. Um, so it is frustrating. Yeah. Cause even now, you know, the, the big channels that are getting all the stuff are literally just vlogs that people could just do of their daily lives who go out and do one or two interesting things and then they have 50 people working on editing and making the video so it's legitimately like they can put out stuff daily and get that watch time so much faster and get so much more views just simply because they're putting out more content it's it's about quantity now what called there's actually oh there was actually a YouTuber who I watched, who I absolutely adore, called Video Game Donkey, who he's got like 7.5 million subscribers. And he always takes time with his videos. He puts out like two, three videos a month and usually makes them like six, seven minutes. But that doesn't work with YouTube's algorithm. So he did an experiment where for a week and a half, he posted a two minute video every single day that just sucked, that it was bad and he purposely made it bad and then he got an email hey your viewership is up 166 percent great job and he's like <laughs> come on yeah yeah it's uh it's a tricky thing to figure out but and then and then the other thing is like you're putting like it used to be all about the independent creator like nowadays you know any anybody with a cell phone can take a video upload it straight to the YouTube app through their, like, it's, it's so easy. Like back in the day, you actually needed a legitimate microphone and camcorder and all that stuff and take the SD card out of the camera and put it in the computer, edit the video. Like it, it took a little bit of time. Yeah. yeah and yeah. nowadays, you know, the independent creators, they are not the ones that get promoted on the homepage. You, you see like people like Jimmy Fallon, who I mean, nothing against Jimmy Fallon, but he's, he's got a, late night talk show on NBC like does he need the promotion does he need the ad revenue or does the independent creator who's doing this full-time who doesn't have that deal in place who doesn't have sponsors and everything you know so it, it, it's yeah it's just all around frustrating but it it really is because like you mentioned John Krasinski Will Smith they started a vlog show on YouTube and got five million subscribers in two weeks because they're famous and right how's anyone supposed to compete with that yeah exactly mm. yeah well speaking of uh all around frustrating and <laughs> <Oof>. <laughs> yeah um i guess we should i guess i want i want to start with um actually i don't i don't even think i know the story like how did you how did you end up in georgia where you are right now um so i lived uh for 14 years um in Connecticut, um, just because, you know, my, my dad's job was in New York. Connecticut just has the better school system. It's cheaper to live there than New York. So we just lived there. Um, and then complicated stuff uh, happened with my dad's work. They were basically uh, trying to push him out of the company. So he said, okay, I'll, I'll go find another job. So he went and found a job uh, down in Atlanta and they figured, you know what, uh, you know, I am, my brother's already graduated from college. I'm in college. My sister uh, was going into college uh, that year. Like, it's, it's just the time to downsize. So I uh, went down to Georgia and honestly just kind of love it here. It's really amazing. You would not believe how cheap things are down here. Honestly, like, I enjoy not being taxed like the Northeast. Now, is Georgia tax free? Not tax free, but definitely at a, a significantly lower rate. Okay, I'm, t I'm talking about sales tax. I guess I should have. Uh, no, nah, I, I think we have sales tax. Sales ta I have okay. to say because I, I know because I know we don't in Delaware, and I think 
New Hampshire's one, and uh, I think I think it was like five states. I can't remember what they are, but uh, does Georgia have steel tax? Okay, yeah, it, it's only at four percent though. It's not that bad. Okay, yeah, 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 definitely compared to a lot of states. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. But yeah, I guess yeah. I don't. I don't even know where to start with all the political <laughs> stuff. I mean, I, I've I've even said this like on my socials the last few weeks. Like I I, I mean you know because like whenever I came on the end, like I I just kind of shied away when you and Chase started going at it. But uh, <laughs> you know, it's just it's it's too important now. It's it's kind of unavoidable and it's infiltrated everything. Um, oh yeah. But what's the climate been like? You know, being being in Georgia, like the the entire world has been watching Georgia for the last two months with these with these Senate races. It is. Um, it has been. I have to say, I I'm a political science major. I love politics. It's been kind of draining because <laughs> even you know you mentioned it prior. Uh, TV ads, legit. I would just be sitting down to watch. Uh, the good doctor or anything like that just a show with my family and then they'll be like did you know john ossoff is a chinese communist who like kisses joe biden on the mouth i was like well, uh, I'm not sure how much of that is actually true and then the other side's like kelly leffler owns a five million dollar house it's like okay like this isn't telling me anything about their policies so and then of course it's uh on my phone i'm getting like five phone call a day of oh hey are you planning on voting yes where do you live uh here okay and uh who do you plan on voting for x candidate and this asked me okay i'm not sure if this is actually political you're trying to steal my information so i got about five calls a day uh about three people a week knocking on our door asking us to go vote signs everywhere it was quite frankly i I was just happy the election was over. I didn't even care too much who won. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess it, it wouldn't have mattered too much if, uh, if it didn't decide the entire um, majority of <laughs> the Senate. And I guess now with, with the Democrats picking these seats up, it's the smallest possible majority you can have. But, oh yeah. It's, uh, it's still, I'm kind of, uh, at one point I'm I'm somewhat happy, but also kind of a little upset because, you know, as I mentioned before, I'm more left-leaning and I despise Donald Trump. And the fact, you know, someone pointed out that when Trump was elected in 2016, Republicans controlled the House, the Senate, and had the White House. And now just a mere four years and two elections later, they have none. So quite frankly, that's entirely on him that's his fault but at the same time i'm also like hey well we 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 need we need some representation we actually need some republicans to step up and still have a voice yeah well i mean that was that was my thing first of all it's like i think left leffler debated right like she she did yes she had i I felt like she was totally i mean i didn't watch the whole debate I, I just it's, like I it's tried. okay yeah it's, it's i mean it's raining not my not my not my candidates not my race but um yeah i felt i felt like from the clips i saw she kind of dodged some questions wasn't very well prepared and then purdue didn't even show up <laughs> and, uh, no. and, and Ossoff got like a straight however long it was just to talk to georgians and it's you know it's hard for me because because i've i've always been a little bit more right leaning you know i'm mm-hmm. a more moderate conservative um not a huge fan of trump but you know it's it's hard for me to have sympathy from a gop when your candidate doesn't even show <laughs> up to like you know you got to at least show some effort and actually try and show that you're willing to represent your people and take their questions and you know fix the issues that are important to them yeah and it also really sucks because there are a lot of Republicans who are very intelligent and have very good things to say, like uh, Liz Cheney from Wyoming, uh, Kissinger, I think he's from uh, Texas, Dan Crenshaw, uh, Mitt Romney. It's a lot of very smart people who are doing good things. And I 
quite frankly admire them for what they're doing but those aren't the voices being promoted it's trump it's lindsey graham it's howley and they're just like blatantly lying and that's just a bad rep for the gop yeah yeah it's i don't don't know i think i I had to take like a few days off social media after last wednesday just because of how i get that ugly everything got but um Mm -hmm. it's yeah you know it's it's almost as if and and just like just hear me out here like embracing a celebrity businessman who's might be the most controversial person on the planet as the face of your entire party for four whole years was not a good idea yeah (laughs) who'd have thought right yeah because even like you know one thing i saw is you know like uh, one of the most monumental elections in the past 20 years was 2008 when Barack Obama became the first black president elected people were happy people wore his merchandise they wore his hat they wore hope stickers and you know that was good people were happy but then like you know after he won it, you didn't see people walking around with Obama flags you didn't see people wearing like hope hats like on top of that and other Democrats also kind of were just involved in the party. Like you said, it's like, it's so well, that crazy. Was, that was what struck me about the Capitol storming was I felt yeah. like there were, I mean, it wasn't particularly close. There were more Trump flags than there were American flags. And yeah. I just thought to myself, okay, what message does that send? Like, yeah. And even the slight irony to me is, you know, people had like blue lives matter flag and then they went in and were just like assaulting police officers. So I'm like, explain to me how, the, how that works. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I completely understand you want to take a break from it. I think one thing that's a, a definitely a problem and I've had to stop myself too is from just like doom scrolling on Twitter from yeah. just, I'm looking for bad stuff and that really kind of weighs down on a person. And yeah. I think we actually need to address that. Well, I, I saw, I saw a post on Facebook. Um, like somebody just like listed out, like if Democrats win control of the Senate, here's everything that's going to happen. <laughs> and I thought to myself, okay, wait a second. Your side had all three branches. And I, I say your side is, I mean, it's almost my side. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, yeah. I'm an independent registered i've always been um i've I've thought about going libertarian just that i have some sort of affiliation because i i do kind of see myself as in the middle on on more social issues and everything but you know i i i look at the republican party four years ago you had all three branches for two years and you couldn't even repeal obamacare yeah like it's like you when you talk about abolishing the electoral college you know, putting 15 justices on the Supreme Court, like all these, all this fear mongering, this doomsday stuff that you're talking about, like, like getting rid of the second amendment, like it's going to take time, like something that monumental of a change, like it's going to need bipartisan support. Like you're not going to do that with a 50 plus one majority in the Senate and Joe Biden as president, like, and there, and there's no guarantee that you're even going to have the house in, in two more years. So and well, how much of this is actually going to get done before we, I mean, it's these days with how long campaigns last, like we'll, we'll be in the election cycle again before you know it. Ugh, yeah, I, which will suck because I just think we need a break. But even like the point is actually people forget, you know, Democrats still have control of the House. Republicans gained more seats than Democrats did in this past one. And so it's like one, it's like 212 to 198 or something right now. I forget the exact numbers for what, how the house is split, but like you said, it, it's super narrow. This is not, oh, it's 100% Democrat, 100% this, they're going to pass this radical agenda. Which one? They're not. That's like, what I hate is people were like, oh, Biden's going to implement socialist stuff. I'm like, okay, 
I don't think you know what socialism is. <laughs> this is a very minor power shift. Not much is going to change. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Like you said, like you said, it's all, it's very draining. Um, and I'm just, I'm kind of looking forward to having a break from it. Um, yeah. My, like, I, I say this unironically, what I want Joe Biden to do when he's in the white house is I can go one week and I won't hear a single news story about him. Not a good thing. Yeah. Not a bad thing. Just one week. And I can forget he's president. Yeah. And that'll be the best he can do for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I've, I didn't, I didn't vote for either of them. Um, I but, entirely understand. Yeah. Well, and also the thing is like, I, I did vote. I, I, don't, I want, don't want people thinking I didn't do my civic duty. I, I did go third party. Um, but who who do you vote for? If you don't mind me asking. I vote, yeah. I don't, I don't mind saying I voted for Jorgensen. Um, oh, she was cool. I so, liked her. Yeah. She made sense. Didn't agree with her on everything, but I thought she was the best option available to me at the time. And also, I think she knew what Aleppo was. Um, I hope, <laughs> but in all, yeah, I thought, I thought. See, this is this is my thing with the libertarians. Like, I feel like there's a growing divide in both parties right now. You have the the far radical left and and the alt right, you know, conservatives who have just lost their minds and left moderate Republicans out to dry and and call them rhinos now. Um, and so is there some place in the middle where you, you can have fiscal conservatism and responsibility and social acceptance and tolerance? But then like, like have you ever watched a libertarian debate? I have. It's like so four years ago, Austin, they're, they're asking Austin Peterson about drugs or something. And uh -huh. he says like, you know, we, we need to end the war on drugs and everything, but you have to be reasonable. You should, and, this, and these were his exact words. You should not be allowed to give heroin to a five-year-old and he gets booed the president has no constitutional authority to regulate drugs that being said at the state level i would support some legislation that would stop children from being allowed to purchase drugs and prosecute anyone who would put a child in danger because i do believe the children do need some protection yes you should not be able to sell heroin to a five-year-old <laughs> something similar to that is there like oh do you need a driver's license to yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, Gary yeah. Johnson get, said, I'd like to see some competency. <laughs> Should someone have to have a government issued license to drive a car? Hell no. What's next? Requiring a license to make toast in your own damn toaster? <laughs> the license to drive? You know, I'd like to see some competency exhibited by people before they drive. <laughs> and then he <laughs> just. <laughs> one side's like what do you need next a license to use a toaster it's like no we should prove people they should drive before they yeah. get a license and he gets booed and it's like how is it that like you know libertarians like joe jorgensen and like um joe walsh who were considered like super far right before are actually kind of making sense and looking more like moderates right now what does that yeah. say well i feel like there's i'm, I'm already looking ahead to like 24 like yeah. who who would, who would I like to see run? And I, I wanted a mosh, if I'm being honest, Justin Mosh, mm. the former rep from, actually became, he changed parties. So he actually became the first sitting member of the house to be a member of the Libertarian Party um, while, while he was serving in Congress. I respect him. Yeah, yeah. I'd like him. And he actually, he didn't run for reelection, but his successor, um, what's his name? Peter Meyer, I think. Meyer's his last name. He was, he was one of the 10 that just voted to a, voted against his party to impeach Trump. Um, so they're, the two of them definitely are on good terms with it. Anyway, um, you know, he, he had explored potentially running for president and ended up not going through with it. But you know, I feel like he's got to be on the short list. And, and that's somebody that I think would make the most sense. You know, Somebody who has experience of, and a fair amount of experience in Congress, um, you know, who knows how the political game kind of works, but is still truly grounded in libertarian values. Um, yeah. You know, you, you could go with somebody like Joe Jorgensen, who's a libertarian for life, but nobody really knows who she is until she starts running her campaign. You could go with, I guess you could go down the Trump route, try to find a celebrity. I don't know if 
Mar- I know Mark Cuban said he's maybe interested in running. I don't know if he'd run as a libertarian, but please no. That's the yeah. one thing I've found so far is I'm like, outside of all the horrible things Trump has done, I think there's a certain way things have to be done in DC and you have to be a politician to know how to do it. And so I think Trump had a much steeper learning curve than the yeah. average person going for president. Well, yeah, I mean, I said, I said four years ago, I feel like he's either going to be the best or one of the best or one of the worst presidents yeah. we've had. Because either he's going to be the outsider that comes in and knows how to manage the finances and fixes all those issues and drains the swamp, like he was saying, and gets rid of all the corruption. Or, you know, the corruption is going to, he, he's going to buy into it just as much as everybody else and not know what he's doing and, you know, cause a, uh, cause a mess like we saw last week. And yeah, and unfortunately, that's what it was. Yep. And, you know, like you said, like, gathering for, I think Justin Amash would be great just because they're very tempered, very intelligent people. Uh, also, a guy I've actually been looking is the governor of Massachusetts, Baker, because, you know, you look at Massachusetts, which I don't think they've voted for a Republican since Reagan. And they, he's still a Republican in a very liberal state with like 60% support. That's, he's pretty amazing. I, yeah. I, I remember the midterms a couple of years ago, like they called, they called Warren's Senate race like that, but they also called Baker's governor race, even though he's the completely opposite party. They called it right away because he's just got such strong support. Yeah, it's it's slightly encouraging, honestly, to see where it's like, hey, you know, as we, a lot more people are just voting along party lines. If you're real, if you're just like really good and you're a good person, you can win, and yeah. that's encouraging. Yeah, I we had a uh, we had Shane on a few months ago, my roommate, who actually I think he told me uh, it's gonna be. Are you guys gonna be roommates? Yeah, we're gonna be in Fulton together. We're roommates yeah. last semester. Yeah, because I just because I graduated a semester early, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to keep up with you guys in here. I'm I'm sure you guys are gonna get along just fine and oh yeah, and Shane, do all right. But, Shane's a great guy. I love yeah. him. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Shane is a really great guy. Um, but when when we had him on, you know, I was talking about people a lot of times say you know vote blue no matter who or you know i don't know i don't know if there's a vote maybe we can say vote red no matter what trump says (laughs) (laughs) i like that get that that, that on a bumper sticker yeah but uh yeah i i like when when i voted i i looked and you know actually did my research on all the candidates is like i don't i don't want to just look at the letter if it's next to their name and blindly vote based on that i want to actually get to know these people get to know what their policies are what their background is and what they support what they oppose and i'll make my decisions from there that's smart honestly because i think even um you know kind of going into this year i would i just you know hated people that my party told me to hate because like you know one guy who's a major republican donor charles Koch, who um you know i'm like oh he's awful he's terrible and i actually interned with the Koch Institute over the summer and read about him like, wait, this guy's actually really smart. Where he's like, hey, the, there should be less federal occupancy license where it's like, oh, you have to train a hundred hours to become a barber. Oh, but you can't you know, have a former felony conviction on your record or else you can't get that. He goes, what does having a felony do with you being a barber? And, or even he's like, no, we need economic opportunity for people who have entered this country illegally if they want to work we should give them opportunities to work and i'm like this guy makes sense i thought i thought i was supposed to hate him but he's actually like really smart yeah yeah i think you know what what gives me hope is like seeing you know you and chase do your radio show for so long and you know you and i i think we're definitely not on the same side of the political spectrum on every issue but you know, we can still sit down like we're doing right now and have these conversations and yeah, not hate each other and actually <laughs> get somewhere and and give each other the perspective that we bring and and really make us think about, you know, okay, we believe this, but why do we believe this? You know, what what yeah. is our what's our belief grounded in? Yeah, and I I think that's important because unfortunately, I feel like so much of the political discourse has just fallen onto gaining internet points by wrecking people on twitter 
And that just kind of further divides it because I, I actually saw a study recently that Twitter actually did through analytics. They found that 90% of political content that's put out there is put out by just 5% of Twitter users. So it's a gym like, okay, great. So th this is the furthest of the furthest, the people who want attention politically to go out there. So actually just talking person to person and actually being like, hey, no matter what you believe, you're still my friend. I think that's kind of still really important. Yeah, well, actually, speaking of Twitter, I guess we should, it's, it's, oh, yeah, yeah. it's kind of the elephant in the room. Um, <laughs> yeah, I have... I mean, I, I put a long thread about this out on social media, but I've got mixed feelings about Trump being banned. Um, yeah. You know, but I, I'm curious to get your thoughts on it. Well, you know, I, I kind of, you know, just kind of posted one thing about it on my Instagram. And it's just the two points, I, two things I have to say about it are one, Donald Trump absolutely deserved to get banned from Twitter for inciting the insurrection against the Capitol. Two, that standard that Twitter has held Donald Trump to has to be held to every other user. Because, you know, people have pointed out there are Antifa accounts who promote violence who do that. Uh, with the uh, riots that happened over the summer, people encouraging it. Uh, it was that even so far as internationally, there are Chinese diplomats who are denying that the uh, Uyghur Muslim genocide is happening, or even sometimes saying, yes, we are doing it, but it's for the right reasons. But those people need to be held accountable as well. Yeah, yeah. well, it's, that was the thing to me, is that, you know, say what you will and believe what you believe. Was it, was it right or wrong? You know, is Twitter justified in that decision? You set a precedent now. And mm -hmm. so it's hard, it's hard to justify letting the Iranian Supreme Leader keep his access to Twitter <laughs> if, the, if the President of the United States, you know, it, it's a complicated issue. You know, yeah. I, I think pe people, were, people were blindly celebrating it or blindly saying, you know, that free speech is under attack. You know, I think, I think you really have to take a deep look at it and understand all the various factors here and you know, yes, Twitter is a private company, but is it a monopoly with big tech? And, you know, it, there, there's a whole, there's a whole group of issues that, you know, it's not just one way or the other to me. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because it's also, you know, this isn't just a regular person tweeting. This is the president of the United States. And it, as much as we don't want to admit it, he has to be treated differently than everyone else and you can't just and no matter what you do with his tweets and his voice on social media people are going to be upset because even i saw a while back when uh, trump had the when the looting starts the shooting starts tweet it was flag it was hidden behind i think a barrier or something like this could contain offensive information and people got mad about that so yeah yeah, well, that, that, different. that to me was the compromise is that, yeah. you know, okay, we're not going to, we're not going to, normally we would take something like this down if it was, you know, so-and-so with only 500 followers, but this is a tweet from the president. Yeah. So maybe it's kind of important that what he has to say remain available. So, so we'll hide it or we'll flag it and say, Hey, you know, here's a disclaimer, but you know, it is, do we need to leave it up here because of who it's coming from? And but then, but then you consider the voice that the president of the United States has, and how many? I think, I think it was like eighty-eight million Twitter That's followers. I mean, ridiculous like that, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, very, very complicated to me. Yeah, um, and we've it, never had to. Consider. And unfortunately, like, there's. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of legal cases about this because legitimately, we, I think. Obama was the first president to have a Twitter account, but even he had his assistant's interns, interns assistant running the Twitter account. He had very little to do with it. This was the first time we really saw a major world re leader kind of transition and still use their personal Twitter account from a political office. Yeah, and it's always. 
I always wish like if technology had been available, like what would George Washington's Twitter feed have looked like? Or what would Lincoln's or Roosevelt's, you know, it's just something interesting to consider that we, we didn't have before. Um, it's a whole new way to communicate. I, and, I feel like, I feel like Lincoln's would have been really cool. I feel like he would have been incredibly sassy because I've heard that's like what he was in real life. Yeah. Yeah. Or like, or FDR doing his fireside, instead of the fireside chats, you could just speak to the nation through Twitter. Um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, nowadays you think of the, the whole transition process, like now there's like the official at POTUS account that like needs to be transferred over to Joe Biden's team instead of Donald Trump's team. So. Yeah, it is. I've been having to think about things politically. I never thought I'd have to think about like, even I saw literally um, yesterday um, moving boxes arrived at the white house. So uh, the Trump family can move their things out of the white house and people were cheering like yes it's finally happening and i'm like i never thought i'd have to think about how does the president move out of the white house and i just never thought i'm like huh i guess there are like personal effects and stuff that they have to put away okay (laughs) this is weird yeah well i i don't know i'm just i'm hopeful we can get through um i guess wednesday is going to be the 20th right so uh yeah i think wednesday's the yeah. 20th. so just get through that day get through i don't know isn't there some like i feel like it's one of the reps that is i don't know if she's QAnon affiliated uh, or something he's like already said she's going to try to impeach biden on day one which i don't know uh, people talk about unity and trying to <laughs> what's that gonna like what is I don't know. It just makes no sense it's, to me, but it's difficult. And quite honestly, the, the cabinet I've gotten into doing is it's so easy if we take the radical people from either side and treat them as the norm, but we can't do that. Just one thing I've started getting into is like, if someone has an extremely stupid opinion and that's just blatantly wrong, I just ignore them. Like I heard, uh, this is a dumb example and it goes back to basketball, but I saw um, someone the other day on Twitter being like, Oh, Pascal Siakam is better than Ben Simmons, but we don't like to talk about that. And I'm like, I feel like I could comment under this, but this is clearly just such a stupid opinion. It, uh, it It's not even worthy of my attention. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I always go back and forth when I like, politics aside whatever it is like if I, if I see something that's just like so blatantly kind of out there on social media and I'm like do, do I is, it, is this person even worth me trying to talk some sense into or is it just going to go back and forth and everybody's going to get mad at everybody and it's going to be a complete waste of my time yeah <laughs> literally yeah. the one habit I think the greatest habit I've ever done for my mental health I've stopped reading uh comment sections on twitter and unless it's like under a meme and people are posting like you know reaction gifs and stuff i'm like okay i'm like this is good like Like, it's just it's so toxic like um i don't know i think bubba wallace's team which is uh the new michael jordan's uh 23 11 racing just unveiled like their daytona 500 paint scheme and if you go to you go to the facebook comments and it's all about garage door ropes and you know yeah. the, the controversy this summer at talladega and you know it's, this scheme will look a lot better when it's wrecked on lap one or or just stupid comments like that and it's yeah it's just so toxic and infuriating and you know that those are the same people that you know should bubba wallace win a race or two this year they're gonna they're gonna say it was rigged or nascar scripted it or whatever it's yeah no it's it's horrible it's possible to deal with I will admit, I have to give credit to NASCAR where credit is due. They have handled the issue of racial justice better than literally every other sports league in the entire world. Like, what they did for Bubba uh, Wallace and banning Confederate flags and all that, 
amazing. But yeah, no, it's, I think um, it's definitely, I think, tough just because of, I feel like those same people who do that, you know, people like uh, Charlie Kirk and Ben Shapiro who are like, oh, I saw the NBA players like Neil or, oh, I saw like an MLB team lock arms in unity against racial. I'm never watching the sport again. It's like, yes, you are. Like, stop playing, dude. Yeah, Yeah, I've just, I've decided like, I'm going to boycott boycotts. You know (laughs) what I mean? Like, yeah. Because I feel like people always talk about cancel cancel culture and what, what is cancel culture and when should, like, you know, I feel like a lot of times the the conservatives that are against canceling people for making a mistake when when people get upset if if they say something offensive or whatever, they're the first people to say, "Oh, uh, Kaepernick took a knee." Here's a list of every NFL sponsor boycott every NFL. It was like, well, I'm I'm sorry. I thought we were against canceling people who did things that we didn't necessarily like or agree with. Yeah. Which one is it? So. Yeah, that was, yeah, no, that's definitely, I think, a problem that so many people do is it's, oh, you, I disagree with you. I don't have to interact with you. And, you know, there was like stuff coming out as a while ago. It's like, oh, like the uh, soul cycle and like Orange Fitness, they support Donald Trump. It's like, wait, no, they didn't. What it was is that the minority shareholder who owns like 20% of each also is the majority shareholder of the Miami Dolphins and unrelated to those two companies, he went out and uh, donated like $500,000 to the Trump campaign. And like that guy's son held a chair, had like a fundraising event for Trump. And I'm like, can we really say that like soul cycle and orange fitness, like, support throwing children in cages because i I think that's a bit of a stretch honestly yeah yeah i totally agree Mm. yeah well man i i just like like you said it's been exhausting um to to think (laughs) about all this stuff um you know we've been going for i think an hour and a half now so i want to let you get to the gym and everything um i appreciate you taking the time this afternoon i know we've been wanting to, to do this for a while um and it finally worked out. So I, I'm, I'm thankful for that. And like I said, thankful that we can, we can have these open and honest conversations and, you know, agree to disagree if we have to, but try to find some common ground and, and talk about these issues. Cause I think they are important. Um, and that's something that's become a lost art with how polarized and, and divided we are. So I appreciate that. And I wish you the best of luck this semester. I know you and Shane are going to have, um, a good time together and yeah. certainly hope that you know covid pending it's uh it's as normal as realistically possible um i'm hopeful with the vaccine being rolled out now that you know we're we might be closer to the end than the beginning hopefully we'll see um as long as everybody keeps doing their part staying safe and everything but yeah uh yeah. wish you nothing but the best my man yeah thank you very much I, you know thank you so much for having me on here and if you ever want me to come on again the next time Kyrie does something stupid I am more than willing to do that so I'll be here next week yeah <laughs> yeah I don't know maybe we can uh I've only got the basic zoom so I think I can only do 40 minutes but I don't know maybe we can even get Chase in here and and, and try to do like an episode of the end again or something like that but uh <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. That let me know how yeah let me know how radio goes because it like didn't happen this fall. Like I had to, I had to do it myself, um, which was frustrating, but yeah, I don't know. Try to get on Chase's uh, case there. See, I mean, I don't even know how much power he has in the whole thing. Oh, Tipton? Or tip. Yeah. I mean, I guess I was, I was oh, talking about yeah, Chase he, Strauss, but yeah. Okay. Guess, yeah. No. I'll, yeah. I'll I don't, I don't even know who the, who the leadership is now. Oh, nowadays. Tipton got forced to resign. Okay. Which is good because he sucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, maybe i'll, right, maybe I'll but, cut that out but whatever um <laughs> <laughs> you could you yeah. cut out whatever you want but yeah no thank you so much for having me it's really good to get in touch with you again yeah all right man enjoy the rest of your day and uh hopefully i'll talk to you soon yeah you too see you man all right see ya